Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today. I'm Todd Becker. Today, we're going to discuss the essential role of seafood nutrition in the evolution and health of the human brain. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Crawford. In 1971, Dr. Crawford published the first evidence of the role of two essential fatty acids, DHA and ARA, which is arachidonic acid, in the evolution of the brain. This was followed by studies uh, documenting the important role of these essential fatty acids in preventing behavioral disorders, and particularly their presence in breast milk for preventing preterm birth and neurodevelopment disorders in human infants. Dr. Crawford is visiting professor at Imperial College in London and has been director of the Institute of Brain Chemistry and Human Nutrition since 1990. Among his numerous honors and prizes, Michael was elected by his peers to the Hall of Fame at the Royal Society of Medicine in 2010. He's published more than 300 peer-reviewed scientific papers and four books, most recently, The Shrinking Brain, which documents the evolutionary evidence for the role of marine food web in human nutrition and the societal threats posed to brain nutrition and intelligence by recent changes in the food supply and the human diet. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thank you. Uh, let's start by talking about two molecules, DHA, that's docosahexaenoic acid, and ARA, which is arachidonic acid. And can you start by describing the chemical structure of those two molecules and how that plays into their electrical and signaling functions in the cell and in the brain? Well, that's a long story. Um, uh, let's start with arachidonic acid, because we it's very simple. It's a 20 carbon fatty acid with some four methylene interrupted double bonds. And it's responsible for a heck of a lot of stuff. The Nobel Prize in 1982 from uh, Bergstrom, Samuelson, and Bain was given uh, for the discovery of the role of arachidonic acid in cell regulation, which is involved in many different aspects. For example, um, 99% of the time, which is being converted to prostacyclin in, in, by your endothelial cells, the circulation of your blood. And that maintains the blood flow, uh, blood pressure, and it stops um, irritated uh, platelets from sticking to the wall of the endothelium and causing them a thrombus. So, uh, but it does all sorts of other things. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of the immune system, it, 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 it stimulates the immune response, which is important if you have um, injury, of course. It was very much involved in the response to injury and so on. So it, ha it is the um, parent of this whole range of um, cell regulating um, molecules that operate at very tiny concentrations. Surgically acting at the specific site of requirement. Now, um, the cosahexanoic acid, on the other hand, is a molecule which we think um, was the original chromophore. In in that, uh, when the um, oxygen tension had reached the point at which everything life became thermodynamically possible. This was about 600 million years ago in, in the Vengi. Um, <clears throat> there was this explosion of not just everything life, but all 32 phylum that we know today, the different shapes and sizes of forms of different animal life. Uh, it's called the Cambrian explosion. And this happened in a very short geological time span. So everything happened at a very great speed at, at, at that time, and then got a bit quieter after that. Well, one of the key issues as to why this may have happened, of course, is because um, <clears throat> prior to the advent of oxygen, there was no um, ozone layer. 
And um, uh, so the planet was bathed in intense solar radiation in, in, in the ultraviolet region. Now, de Cossack snoic acid, which is a 22 carbon fatty acid, it has six double bonds, that's 12 pi electrons. And each double bond is separated by a metal in, um, a, we call it metal in interruption. So electrons can't move up and down the molecule as, as with a conjugated double a sequence of double bonds. Um, they're stuck in their respective worlds. And this turns it into a resistor. But it's only a resistor up to a certain point because if you increase the potential difference across the membranes where it lies, um, you could suck out an electron. Once you suck out an electron, it can then, through a system we call tunneling, electron tunneling, it can then act as a conductor. So it's a semiconductor in a sense. Now, <clears throat> with, it absorbs in the ultraviolet. It doesn't absorb light in the visible spectrum. It absorbs in the mid-UV range. And John Sargent at State Sterling University, um, late John Sargent, analyzed dinoflagellate. And the dinoflagellate is a sort of little single-cell system, very similar to what we, one would expect to have been the first um, air-breathing cells. Um, it, it has a high spot which can both see and photosynthesize. And this is stuff full of dicosahexanoic acid, stuff full of DAT. And not only stuff full of DAT, but it has di-DAT. He described di-dicosahexanoic acid phospholipids in, in this um, dinoflagellate. Now, the extraordinary thing is that you and I have di-DAT in our own photoreceptors. So what this really tells us is, is that the earliest living systems were using dicosahexanoic acid in vision that what effectively was happening was DHA was absorbing in the ultraviolet light and hitting, that would kick out electrons and these electrons would start sort of running around the system causing hairs to, to, to shake and do all sorts of you put your finger in, a, in, in an electric plug and you start, you get a chop and, and so this this would have initiated, as the system became multicellular, this would have initiated the beginning of the nervous system and ultimately through the brain. Right. So as you say, this DHA was present in this very early single cellular organism, right? Uh, it was in the dinoflagellate. This was, what, 600 million years ago? 600 million years ago. Yeah. And this is the same molecule that's dominant in our brain. It's unchanged, yes, yes, right? Absolutely. It's, and and it's, it's been, I mean, we have DHA in our own eyeballs today. We have it in our own synapses. We have it in our neurons. This is where it's really concentrated and gave it the, um, uh, spoke the idea that, that it was a, um, a signal transducer. Um, and and so it is really fundamental. If you look at the the cephalopods, right at the very beginning, four hundred and fifty million years ago, the, the, we have four dyes in the cephalopods, and the cephalopod eyes are very similar to human eyes, and they're they're in the stuff full of DHA, and the fish, both in the eyes, the synapses, and, and the neurons, the brains, the fish. The um, amphibia, the reptiles, uh, the mammals, the birds, and ourselves, all, without exception, use the cosahexanoic acids in the signaling systems, in vision, and in the brain. This is such a remarkable fact that it's been so conserved from the, these hundreds of millions of years, and that it's the common denominator as you say, in vision, in the eye, in nerve transduction, and in the brain. And it's, it's essential to, our, to the functioning of our brain. Um, and then, then you mentioned the other molecule, arachidonic acid, which is present in all mammalian brains, right? So in similar ratio, and it's conserved. So can you say a little bit more about how is it that these two molecules, DHA and ARA, are in similar ratios in all mammalian brains. How did that come about? Well, um, it's, 
I mean, the brain is made up of all sorts of different cells. Different cells, cell types have different com compositions. But uh, uh, the broad scope of things, the neurons and synapses are rich in DHA and have got arachidonic acid as well. Whereas the um, Michel Lagarde from Lyon um, shows that this, the, the, the astrocytes um, are, are, are rich in arachidonic acid. And they, they each have two different functions. The neurons obviously are involved in, in um, thinking and thought processes and doing things. Um, whereas the astrocytes are involved in maintaining um, the uh, myelin and are maintaining the neurons and synapses in good health. They're, they have a foot against the uh, blood circulation in the brain and so they're taking the nutrients from the blood and making sure that the rest of the brain is healthy. So um, although there's this, uh, in my mind, distinction between the two, uh, the astrocytes and the neurons, it's uh, far more complex than that, but um, let's just leave it to that sort of little distinction. Yeah. So I guess this is quite interesting that if you look at all mammalian brains, you've got these two molecules, DHA, ARA, um, in similar in similar ratio. So one of the big differences, though, is the size of the brain across the species. So how did what started out as a small brain, what, what factors lead it across the animal kingdom to get larger? What was the driving force there? And then how does that culminate in the large human or hominid brains. Let's start with how did it shrink. Okay. Uh, and um, when you look at the brain size relative to the body size, with uh, virtually all small mammals like rats, guinea pigs, hyraxes, and things like that, squirrel, for example, a, a very bright little animal, a squirrel with, with quite intensive uh, neurological function. Um, the squirrel actually, in relation to, to brain size, in relation to its body, has got a bigger brain than we have. Um, it's about 2.5% of the body size. We're 1.9 uh, or thereabouts. Um, so the interesting thing is these small mammals can make DHA from the parent, which occurs in all photosynthetic systems. That's why the marine system is rich in it, because it starts with photosynthetic stuff. Whereas the land-based system, the food web has got two sides to it. It's got the seeds um, and it's got the our bread, if you like, and, and it's also got the leaves. The leaves are rich in dicosahexanoic acid, but the seeds are rich in arachidonic acid. Not arachidonic acid, but it's, it's the parent linoleic now, uh, these little little animals, like rats or hyraxes and uh, squirrels, can make DHA quite effectively from the green stuff. Even chickens can make make, make it from the green stuff. Um, but as the process of making DHA is rate limited, it's a slow process. Andrew Sinclair, and I showed in the early days that um, if you um, provided radio isotopically labeled DHA and its precursor from the green food, alpha linolenic acid, with a different label, and fed the two labels to developing rat pups, the DHA was used for brain growth and construction, assumably function. The order of magnitude more efficient than trying to synthesize it from alpha linolenic acid because it's a slow process. So the problem is that as you get bigger and bigger bodies, uh, you outstrip the ability of the animal to make DHA. It, it's accumulating protein, you see. And, um, and you could take a rhinoceros, for example, compared to the squirrel. And the rhinoceros has, has all the protein it needs from the simplest food, namely grass. And um, it builds 
a huge body of one ton in four years. But the brain, are, <laughs> brain size is only 350 grams. So what in fact had happened is universally throughout the animal kingdom, um, the brain size has shrunk in relation to body size as the animals got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, bigger. and that's certainly true like across the herbivores. But then, as you pointed out in your book, carnivores have an advantage, right, in that uh, they can get a source of that the, the DHA from the animal that they eat, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. They, they, they get the lifetime effort of an animal at one meal kind of thing. But they still can't make a big, big brain. They still... I mean, the lion, lion's brain size is quite small, actually. It's only about, uh, again, it's in the same sort of water, so about 350. But they, they clearly, in evidence, they have a much more sophisticated visual system, to begin with, and then they have a much more sophisticated peripheral nervous system because the, the, the legs end and arms end in, in articulated claws which is quite different to the herb herbivores, which end in hooves, you know, with no fingers, no claws, hooves. There's a, the, the whole thing is shrunk. Even the peripheral nervous system is shrunk as, as these animals got bigger and bigger. So that is the shrinking brain in, on, on the land-based footwear. As the herbivores get bigger, they their brain size is limited. Carnivores can get some more access to it. Um, can't they can't they get sufficient DHA from the livers and the brains of the animals that no, they No, no, because they especially the, 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 the herbivores, if you look at the chemistry, we, we published a lot of this in 90, starting in 1969 in the Biochemical Journal. The herbivores have got uh, just a tiny amount of DHA in their tissues. Uh, it's mainly jacosapentaenoic acid, which is the step before DHA. Um, it's only got five double bonds. But, uh, um, so in, in, in effect, there's not a lot of DHA in these herbivores for the uh, incorporation by the carnivores. They, they have universally, the carnivores have got this neurological advantage with vision and birth, per, um, articulated claws and all that kind of stuff. So they have a, a pretty good extensive peripheral nerve system and a, and a pretty good visual system. As you well know, um, so it's a um, different story. But on, on the whole, what has happened is that the bigger they get, the, the smaller the brain is in relation to body size. Whether you're a carnivore or herbivore, carnivores always have an increase in brain body weight ratio compared with the um, or the, the herbivores, and of course, much greater, which is interesting than the reptiles that were pretty sick is them. Okay, so then uh, I think where, where your uh, uh, innovative thinking has come in is in trying to explain this massive expansion in hominids going from our, our uh, early primate ancestors to this massive growth of the human brain. And so how did that happen? Uh, how is it that humans were able to grow their brain? Well, the... the Let's start with the Great Extinction. In the period before the Great Extinction, the reptiles and laid eggs. The reproductive system was an egg-laying system. When they, whatever happened, and they became extinct, and the great huge trees, the cycads, and the ginkgos, and all the rest of them, shrank and became bod cycads. Um, we had the evolution of the flowering plants. And the flowering plants had these protected seeds which contained linoleic acid. So this introduced what we call the omega-6 family of eccentric fatty acid for the first time in absolute abundance. And that allowed the new, new animal systems, which will be very small at that time, to make arachidonic acid. And so, so, so the key issue here was that the arachidonic acid, with all its um, cell-regulating systems and its uh, adhesion molecules and so on and so forth, would make the egg stick. 
to the mother. And this is quite different to the the egg laying system. The egg laying system, um, the, the new life only got one squirt of good stuff, whereas the placental system, as it evolved, got this profusion for nine months in the private as they evolved. So what we now have is arachidonic acid playing a key role in the um, evolution of the mammoths, specifically. Right, because that allowed a much longer gestation, right? Yeah, uh, and, 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 we, and this, this in effect um, allowed also a, the huge increase in brain size because, as you rightly pointed out, all brains are composed of both arachidonic acid and DHA. So we have this huge increase in brain size compared to the reptilian egg laying stuff for a start. Then the, set that against the evidence that all, without exception, land based mammals, brains shrank as they grew bigger and bigger bodies. So, how did early Homo sapiens escape that trap? And the reason for the escape of the trap can only have been access to the marine or the aquatic food web where there was an abundance of DHA. So we now, for the first time in evolution's history, we had both arachidonic acid from the land-based food web and we had DHA from the marine food web. And the two together, boom, and you have this great expansion of the brain. So let's then go to, to this because um, there is this dominant view that humans evolved in the Rift Valley in Africa and the savannas and that what really drove human evolution and the increase in the brain size was hunting, hunting of large megafauna to supply the fat and the calories that allowed the brain to grow, um, right? And that this was the driver. And you're, you're saying something quite different, which is no, it didn't. It didn't happen in the savannas. That we. It happened at the shoreline. So, what's the uh, what's the evidence for that view? Well, the evidence for that is, uh, is as I've already discussed, the shrinking brain on on the Swara footweb. Um, and and you know the point really being is the the Savara footweb provided arachidonic acid, but it had to be pretty bright anyway to go out and take <laughs> spears and bows and arrows and things. You're already bright. Um, the, 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 the point I would like to make is very simple. The, the, the men would go off and hunt for um, to, to catch something. If they caught something, fine. That would be great. That would be lovely. If they didn't, it wouldn't matter. Because the people that, that really count are the women, and in particular the pregnant women. And in fact, the diet of the food web throughout the growth of the, 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 the female shown reproductive age. <clears throat> now, when she's pregnant and perhaps have a couple of children or something like that, the men go off hunting and she can just wander around the coast and pick up the richest food resource on the planet. Well, they're heavily pregnant without expending much energy. And it didn't matter whether the, the men caught anything or not. She would be very happy with, with that. that and, and it's the, the mothers that matter, really. The nutrition of the mother was at all important, and she would undoubtedly be enjoying the fruited del mare um, uh, whilst the men were off trying to do something, if that's the case. And so... What's really driving then the, the growth of the brain is this access to marine food, which is rich in DHA, oh. that, and the mother's eating that DHA, and that's supplying the brain through the whole oh. uh, gestation period. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the missing factor on land-based food is DHA, but both the both are important. They, don't get me wrong, um, but without the marine food web, it's not going to happen. And without the land food web base, uh, it may, but it, I, I don't think it would happen. I mean, if you look at the dolphin, 
The dolphin is very interesting because it has it's the closest uh, relative brain size to Homo sapiens. So compare a dolphin brain, for example, with a, a similar a body sized land based animal, which would be a horse or a zebra. Um, a zebra or a horse has got about 300 grams of brain. The dolphin's got 1.7 kilograms of brain. I mean, this. <laughs> How? Oh, well, I, that speaks for itself. So the but the interesting thing is if you look at the chemistry of the dolphin, it's both rich in arachidonic acid and DHA. It, it it in its food web it's, it's deliberately seeking food from the marine food web that have got arachidonic acid in it. So the importance of arachidonic acid is is there, even in the marine food web. And um and again, with all the marine mammals, they're all very much the same. So, um, uh, it's it's the combination of the two that was really critically important. You can't have it one without the other. Okay, so I think you made a fairly strong case in terms of the biochemistry of the brain, in terms of its lipid composition, and and uh, the long gestation period. I still want to come back because you 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 are really shooting down what's been a dominant theory of this the savanna theory and one of the um one of the arguments that human evolution took place in the savannas and required hunting is the extinction of the megafauna there used to be very large um, you know mammoths and 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 large uh, herbivores that were essentially hunted to extinction at the very time that the human brain size from erectus was was growing. By the time they were doing that sort of stuff, they were pretty bright. The brain was all, already how it would have advanced. You can't make bows and arrows without being pretty bright. Your point would be that this hunting happened after the growth of the human brain. Well, it, it, it would be, yes, it would be a long... You had to be capable of, of, of quite a lot of skillful stuff to make bows and arrows that were effective, and um, certainly to make spears. And I don't think it matters because, as I said, that's what the men were doing. The women, were, on the other hand, were, were on, on the coastline. The men were, were running in, and, and, and these were locally defined regions anyway. So I don't think this is a, a, a contravenes what we're talking about in any manner whatsoever. Okay. So now let's talk about... Um the increase and then the decrease in in human brain size. So you've pointed out that if you go back to early Homo sapiens, we had a brain of about, what, 1,600 cubic centimeters, and that in recent modern humans, it's uh, two or 300 centimeter, cubic centimeters smaller than that. Um, so are, are we less intelligent than our... <laughs> than our ancestors, and if so, uh, well, and if the brain's high says decrease, what drove that? Was it uh, the advent of agriculture? Uh, what changed? Uh, the food web, basically. That, um, there are a lot of people who blame the um, start of agriculture uh, on, on, on that. It becomes a dependence on the land and food web, which... Um, at that time, there would have been no problem with, with the marine and river walk, river food resources. They would have been extremely rich. And in fact, were extremely rich until very recent time. Um, it's, uh, so so I, I, I don't really see a problem there at all. Okay, so it's really since... What, that, what, what was that, uh, like 10,000 years ago when uh, agriculture was, was really... Peaking was that the beginning of the decline of the brain size? That I'm not the only person who believes that that was the case. Um, the um, the interesting thing is that if you consider the evidence, that whatever you believe, and and this is a question of a lot in some people's minds of uh, belief system, but I don't think it's just a belief system. I think the evidence of the Absolute requirement for docosahexanoic acid, and not just docosahexanoic acid, also the trace elements like zinc, potassium, zinc, copper, manganese, um, 
uh, and selenium especially, are, are again richest in the marine food web, and they're all very much dependent, very much important in, in brain development and protection of the brain against peroxidative damage. So um, iodine, again, is another good example of a um, trace element that is important for the brain. You know, iodine deficiency is the commonest uh, um, cause of mental retardation. And there's still 2 billion people at risk to iodine deficiency, and they're all inland populations. I mean, we did some work in Indonesia with the government um, in the beginning of 1900, and um, 60% of the school children had buffalo goat. 60%. And they had over a, a thousand, uh, thousand uh, what was it, about a million mentally, severely mentally retarded children, 800,000 present. But they were all inland. There was none of this in the fishing villages. And so um, what we recommended was that they started developing kelp farming to take, get the iodine into the footwork. And they now have one of the best and biggest kelp farms on the planet, kelp farmers making more money than the inland farms. So iodine is absolutely essential to, to and, and the present day evidence is that the iodine deficiency is confined to inland people. So there you have it. It's not just just DHA; it's also the trace elements that were critically important. The uh, the vitamins, the minerals, iodine. Uh, it, it's really the whole complex. So uh, for that reason, I guess, uh, would you say that just taking fish oil supplements? is not going to do the job. You need that full, complex nutrition from seafood. Yeah, I think that's right. But, I mean, it's better than nothing. But the actual real stuff is where you want to go. But to get back to this business of when did all this start, I think what the question you have to ask is, how did the brain evolve from 340 cranial capacity, CC cranial capacity of a chimpanzee-sized brain, to the 1,700, as has been reported uh, for Cro-Magnon in the period of 28,000 to 32,000 years ago. 1,700, the same size as the dog. Um, how, did, how did that happen? And the answer, one, has to be wild food. Has to be wild food. Whatever you think, it has to be food that was wild. Because nobody was producing anything. It was wild food that powered this expansion from um, 340 cranial capacity to 1,700 cc. Um, we're now at 1,336 cc cranial capacity, and it's a matter of deep concern. And, and if you think about the modern food that we eat from intensively produced stuff, Land-based food, um, if you think about that, and try to think of that in comparison with what? Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination. What wild food would, would, would provide is chalk and cheese. And that's almost certainly the kept reason for the uh, shrinking of the brain. Right. So, um, Michael, one of the central themes of our podcast and of Ancestral Health Society is this idea of evolutionary mismatch. And by that, what I mean is that our modern diet has deviated from the optimal diet that our ancestral, you know, our ancestral homo sapiens evolved to eat for optimal health, which is this wild diet. We have now shifted to an agricultural diet and even more recently to a processed food diet, which is quite different than that of our ancestors. So um, and yet we have very similar genes. So would you say that this food, this change in the diet has driven sort of an epidemic, I mean, sorry, an epigenetic uh, set of switches that have resulted in the smaller brain? Is it really mainly an epigenetic shift? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. If, if you look back at the um, 1900, um, the British Army had to lower the um, uh, size, height of entry into the army from five foot three to five feet, get enough people to um, fight the Boer War. Um, 
after after that was the increase in uh, ag- agriculture and so on and so forth that happened. The the, the um, what what one effectively happened was the average height. This was an increase in protein is attributed to the average height increased by um, 0.4 of an inch every decade. And we now have people six foot six and this kind of stuff. Um, these are all epigenetic changes, and it illustrates just how fast that we change in height, size, and disease pattern. And that's a fact. You can just look at history, and it's a fact. So the epigenetics has driven body size up, but it's driven brain size down. Is that right? That's right. As with the rhinoceros, as with the land, all land-based mammals, without exception, this is what's happened: shrinking brain. You actually looking at brain size? Can you see a change even over the last fifty years? I think you've referenced ni- even since nineteen fifty, you're seeing some changes. Is this the well, case? You can ask: Does it matter? Brain size matters. Out of that, there are lots of people who say, "Ooh, small brains are very good because they're concentrated." Um, well. The fact of the matter is that the University of Hartford has um, presented data showing that IQ has been shrinking since um, 1950. And there's no doubt about it. The mental ill health has been escalated, which is deeply worrying. Um, in 2005, the European Union published an audit of health costs for Europe, in which Brain disorder came top of the list at 386 billion euros. Everybody said, yeah, well, this is just just clever new <laughs> psychiatrists, clever psychiatrists coming up with new diagnostics. Well, even so, if you, if you get brain disorders at the top of the list that have never been thought of before, you thought someone would have paid attention. Anyway, um, the EU did it again in 2010. And it was 789 billion, gone up from 386. Now, we got um, Alf Morris, Lord Morris, time to um, ask questions in the House of Commons. And, and um, the Lord Warner at the time um, answered, well, we, we, don't, we don't know the, the cost of, of mental ill health. But give them credit. They did the numbers. And Joe Nurse, who reported them, except uh, again, Brain disorders, mental ill health, top of the list at 77 billion. So mental illness is on the rise. IQ, there may be declines. But what's the evidence that this is not just correlated with changes in diet, but the reduction in DHA and arachidonic acid are implicated? Is there any evidence that directly implicates those two molecules? I find some evidence about this in in the scientific literature about the role that GHA plays in brain growth, uh, dendritic formation, synaptic formation, um, deficiency causing loss of memory, causing um, brain dysfunctions, and so on and so forth. Uh, The laboratory shelves are just groaning with the evidence. No, I, I agree, and you've you've published a lot on this. And I, I'd like to highlight your role in looking at the role of maternal health and, and maternal nutrition at, at prenatal and infant nutrition. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of the DHA and arachidonic acid content of breast milk and, and in the mother in getting the infant brain off to a good start? The best evidence, which is, is the RSPAC study, which was studied, um, a longitudinal study done by Bristol University, Gene Golden and others, and um, um, Joe Hibbert from the United States National Institute of Health joined them in analyzing the data. Mm-hmm. Um, there were over 14,000 pregnancies, and they followed the children up to um, eight years of age. At eight years of age, verbal reasoning power, um, a whole bunch of behavioral and social scores correlated directly, including motor function, correlated directly, 
was the amount of fish and seafood that the mother had eaten during pregnancy. That's at eight years in the top of eight years. And people who uh, were below the recommendation uh, that they <laughs> and followed the advice given by the FDA and the United States of limiting fish and seafood consumption during pregnancy, they have the worst outcomes. And in fact, um, the in the papers in the Lancet in 2007, uh, the first of many papers, and um, in the paper they say that it's recommendations to limit fish and seafood um, because of false suggestion of mercury toxicity um, would do harm. And uh, there's an absolute straight line function. And, and, and this, this is... Uh, Absolutely superb evidence for on uh, other question. Yeah, and you you pointed out that um, uh, the growth of the brain during uh, during pregnancy uh, is really driven by all the energetics are driven by the formation of the brain from the maternal sources and the DHA and arachidonic acid are critical, especially in the in the in the uh, in that period of pregnancy, right? So, but what about after birth? What about uh, early childhood? Does the does this nutrition continue to uh, lead to be important in brain development? And then, and then past childhood, uh, is there a continued need for DHA and AHA as we get into adulthood and even into our uh, senior years? Well, obviously, breast milk is going to be superior to anything else. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, and, um, uh, but it's important. I, I, I don't understand why the companies have just um, focused on making s substitutes for breast milk instead of saying we need to feed the mother to feed the child because breast milk is full of so many different hormones and all sorts of things like this and the trace elements and stuff. Even fatty acids that, that are not present in, in uh, with carbs, for example. So I, I I I just don't understand the whole this whole concept of, of um I I guess it's arisen because it liberates the mother and able to do work. But you could always I I don't know I'm not a woman so I'm not a wife case. Um, but there's no doubt about it. The brain continues to um make particularly make connections um, from one place to another uh, during during infancy and into childhood. And it's still going to require um, support from the, the food web uh, for, for both its growth and its maintenance. I mean, the brain is, is, is very unique in the sense that it doesn't like being interfered with. And it recycles everything. Uh, and, but no recycling process is 100% efficient, as you well know. Uh, uh, so, in effect, you need a constant supply, drip, drip, if you like, to, to maintain this, this recycling process that goes on. Okay, so we need to continuously replenish uh, the lipids in our brain, even, even, in, even through adulthood. It's not... There's this idea that the brain is somehow fully formed, you know, by adulthood, but but that's not the case. It's constantly being rejuvenated. Is that right? Well, that, that, that's right. I mean, the point about the early developmental process is that during uh, prenatal development, anything that goes wrong there is is permanent, is lifelong, and um, they, the low birth weight and preterm uh, um, birth and maternal malnutrition during this period sentences the child to a lifetime. Of um, disability, so uh, it's it's terribly important to get it right at the beginning, and and that includes maternal nutrition prior to conception, because when when, when a woman comes to, to, to hospital um, pregnancy care, for example, it's usually about twelve weeks after conception, by which time um, the cells that are forming the cortex of the brain are already doing so, so that period between conception when they come for to the hospital to the expert for 
for pregnancy care is a huge amount of, of, of neurodevelopment, neurogenesis has taken place already. So the importance of maternal nutrition and health prior to conception is fundamentally important. And it's more important than what happens during the pregnancy. That's very interesting. Yeah. So let, let's talk, to, let's go now into uh, uh, the nutritional requirements that humans sh should should have to maintain good men mental health into adulthood. How much uh, DHA and arachidonic acid should we have in our diet, you know, on a daily basis? Uh, what's what's kind of the requirement that you, you think we, we need? No idea. Um, WHO uh, and um, FEO, and I was on the expert committee side, reckons that you need just 250 milligrams um, of DHA or, uh, and EPA during pregnancy per day, which is, um, that's what they recommend. But um, I, 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 I hate the I recommend these. I like people to think about the importance of natural food. It was an important of those wild foods which powered the evolution of our brain from 340 grams right up to 1,700. And, and our people, when you start thinking about that, can then make their own decisions about what they should be eating. Okay, so then let's talk about the uh, which fish and shellfish you think are particularly uh, Rich in these, not, not just the the essential fatty acids, but the iodine and the and the and the important minerals. Is it all fish? Is it all well, seafood? Well, or, the, yeah, the shellfish the, the, are, are especially rich in trace elements. Um, mussels are quite cheap. Um, uh, oysters are, are very rich as well. I mean, all, the whole bank of shooting bats. So a lot of them. They're all rich, and there's no question about that. So, no, and the mussels are quite cheap. Oysters nowadays are expensive. But you go back to 1900, as we were talking about earlier, the barman in the east end of London used to go down to the Thames with their buckets and fill them with oysters and put oysters on the bar free for people to bought the beer. Well, that changed. It's changed. Great. And, and uh, just a personal question, which shellfish and fish do you personally like to eat uh, each week? I suspect what um, people did in the past is to just eat variety. Variety is the spice of life. You've talked a lot about wild fish and, and wild seafood. Um, yeah, you see, you know, uh, a lot of debates about the uh, farmed fish versus wild caught fish. Um, there's a lot of arguments saying that we, we shouldn't eat farmed fish, and yet there's a big uh, economic difference for the average person. So what is your view? What's your view on that? Is it, is it bad to eat farmed fish? or it can No, it's not bad to eat okay. farmed fish. They're, they're by and large, they're, they're, they're pretty good. But so they've been losing out on, on uh, DHA, the presence of DHA, having to feed them on chickens and so uh, um, and vegetable oils from the land, which is not a good idea. But um, they're better than, than nothing. They keep you away from a lot of other nasty stuff. Anyway, uh, I mean, we really need to, to, to think a little bit about what happened 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, people said this hunting and gathering stuff is for the birds. Um, we're not really doing very well. We've got to do something new. So 10,000 years ago, they were bright enough it was been agriculture, animal husbandry. We're going to do this seed now. The, 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 the foresight came out very clearly a few years ago. The report to government, 400 scientists, that um, there's no more ar a land available for committing to arable use. In fact, arable land use was shrinking because of urbanization. And we've got to do something new. They never thought about the oceans, but the oceans cover what seventy one percent of the planet is covered in water. And we've now got to start thinking 
uh, about um, the same thing they thought 10,000 years ago uh, with regard to coastal resources and start farming the sea. Japanese are doing it, Koreans are doing it, a whole bunch of other people are doing it. And an island like the UK, um, for heaven's sake, I mean, we've got rich waters, still rich waters, but sadly the fishing fleets have been declining. And, um, and, and I think it's time we started husbanding uh, the marine resources. Um, the Japanese have been doing it now since 1991 or thereabouts. Yeah, you've, um, you've you've you talk in, in in your book, uh, Michael, about the the work that has happened in Okayama, Japan, with uh, Dr. Takahiro Tanaka, uh, to d- actually create a an artificial uh, uh, reef. And 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 can you say a little bit about that? How does that work, and and how successful has that been? Well, it's it's extremely successful. They they, they um first of all. On land, we, we developed pastures for our cows and sheep. And uh, Dr. Takahira Tanaka had, had developed pastures in, in the sea uh, where, where, where the seabed had been ruined by trawlers and things like that. He planted seagrass. And this is wonderful because it not only provides food for the herbivorous fish, it also provides a haven for the, um, the fry to hide from the carnivores. So uh, uh, that's the one thing. And so the planting marine pastures was the first thing. The second thing was to plant artificial reefs because what the marine food web does is to grow on things. And if it doesn't have surfaces to grow, there's nothing to grow on. But artificial reefs provide surfaces for marine flora to flourish. And they designed, they, they had seven target species, and they studied the ecology, the behavior, the, the behavior and the reproductive cycles and so on of these seven individual seven target species. And so they designed the artificial reefs consistent with the ecological behavior of these different species. There's one of them that, for example, like to disappear into holes and things like that. So where this was breeding, they planted artificial reefs full of holes. <laughs> They've been immensely successful. The, um, I suggested this to the governments of Oman a few years ago when I was a, a member of their research um, advisory council. And um, they, they planted uh, 360 hectares of artificial reefs, and they sent me a, a video of how fast they've been closed. In, in, this was two years after planting. They were almost fully clothed in marine flora, and you could see all the little fish that were running around these 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 artificial reefs. Has this caught on in the UK and in the United States as well? Too some of this. Uh, no, there are various people do, doing things like this. Yes, there are various people, but they're all in a small way. We really need this stuff being done on a large scale um, to re- regenerate the fishing communities, um, which is. What Tanaka has done because he's employed all the people who were previously involved in the fishing community um, to, to, to create this. And of course, the, you know, the, he's still capturing, he's still capturing the fish. So he needs the expertise of the people that were involved. And, and the Indonesian things I refer to, the planting of, of kelp, for argument's sake, the kelp forests provide food. They provide fertilizer to replace all the trace elements and various things in, in land-based uh, agriculture. And they capture CO2. The same as the rainforests. They're like rainforests, but in the sea. And they will contribute to um, help with containing global warming and ocean acidification. And not only that, they, they, they make the environment um, healthier for uh, the production of things like oysters and mussels and so on and so forth and all the uh, different um, marine. Yeah, this is a, a great theme of, of, of your book, which which I, I highly recommend to everybody, and that is that uh, developing marine agriculture solves the mental health crisis by 
re regenerative uh, uh, seafoods, but it also fixes a lot of carbon, right? So, and 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 the oceans are, are I mean, there's much more space to grow food there than there is on the surface of of, of the land too, right? So it's uh, it's a huge untapped possibility, and I'm so excited that you've been uh, promoting this, uh, Michael. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So, uh, in, in sort of remaining mi minutes, um, I'm I'm impressed that you're continuing to be active, both in your research and advocacy. What is your your sort of present activity in this area? What where can people follow your work? Well, Pompeii Missile, um, we publish in peer reviewed literature, and uh, we've got a recent um, paper in them journal called Entropy, which um, explains uh, some of what I've been talking about, the role of docosahexanoic acid in visual transduction. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, uh, so this is where we're, we're publishing stuff, apart from the shrinking break, which was the book, which was in a sense which all censored the public and governments about the crisis that we're facing. Um, it is really serious. Uh, um, this diminishing uh, mental health is can only end in dehumanization and uh, can only end in disaster. And, and it, it, it's not that is logical. And we've got to address the issue. The children's society just recently been first in fact. Um, mm. Referrals for mental ill health amongst children had risen threefold in the last three years. This is scary. This is really frightening. And I'm worried about the future of our children and their children in particular. And I now have two grandchildren. So um, I'm, I'm really um, concerned about the whole thing. Um, it's, it's, it's this fate of our children that's at stake. And we've really got to get to grips with this. As I said, in the 2005, 2007, 2010, 2013, five audits of health costs put brain disorders at the top of the list. It's unacceptable that people have not been paying attention to this. It's totally unacceptable. And it's irresponsible because it is the fate of our children and their children is at stake. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for uh, all of the work that you've done, first on the basic science to identify the roles of, uh, of DHA and arachidonic acid and the, all of the associated uh, marine-based nutrients in human evolution and human brain health and for your role as an activist both in helping with women's maternal health and, and the health of infants, and also looking at solutions, uh, global yeah, solutions exactly. to this. Uh, greatly appreciate it and have enjoyed speaking with you today about this and I hope our listeners will check out your your book and if, if interested, get into the research behind it. Thank you, John. That was very kind. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.